the second part of WebRTC signaling, which I mentioned, was finding each other. Okay, and this is going to be called ICE, or that's what you're going to going to remember it as. I'm back at that same page, uh, Introduction to WebRTC Protocols. ICE stands for Interactive Connectivity Establishment. This was really scary trying to figure out the difference between ICE, STUN, and TURN and whether they were necessary when I first started. ICE is just a framework, okay? It, it's not something that you will create. It's a framework, not even a, a real implementation, that allows your web browser to connect with peers. The key sentence is going to be, there are lots of reasons why a straight-up connection from peer A to peer B won't work. So back over here to the whiteboard, we have a client on the left trying to connect a client on the right, and there's a whole bunch of scary stuff out here on the internet. Okay, a whole bunch of crazy stuff, maybe not just scary, and there are mechanisms in place that is going to make it really hard for them to find each other. First of all, it may be that there's a firewall in front of both of them. It may be, and almost certainly, there will be a, a NAT in front of, I've got the, on the right there, uh, we've got firewall for red on the left, and we got... We've got uh, NAT uh, in purple on the right. What is NAT? We'll hop back over to the browser here. Network address translation is what NAT stands for. It's used to give your device a public IP address. Okay, It's very, very common that you will have a router, and that router will have its own public IP address. So into your house, your internet connection comes in, you have one public IP address, and then you have maybe like 10 devices inside your house. You get your phone, your computer, your TV, etc., all of those will have its own private IP address sitting behind that one public IP address. Why is this necessary? Well, there are lots of reasons why this is necessary. The simplest answer is back in 1982 when uh, IPv4 was, uh, was first implemented. Uh, IPv4 was 32-bit based, and there were a grand total of 4,294,967,000 296 total IP addresses, okay? That's a, an absurdly silly, nonsensical number in 1984. What on earth are the chances that we are ever going to have on this planet 4.3 billion devices that will want to talk to each other and be connected to the internet? It's never going to happen. Well, <laughs> 40 years later, we have passed that number. The estimate that I checked as of the making of this video were like 15 to 20 billion. So there aren't enough there aren't enough IP addresses to go around. So we have to have this purple thing here because a lot of devices simply have to share IP addresses, okay? That's a problem, <laughs> right? That's a problem if, if the, the client on the left here can't get to the client on the right because it has a, an IP address that's behind a router, okay, that's behind NAT. Just as a quick caveat, IPv6 has been implemented, and just sort of as a funny side note, there are 340 trillion, trillion, trillion IP addresses available. Uh, if, if I'm right, I think that's the same as saying 340 duo decillion IP addresses. Maybe in 40 years with the advent of AI, there'll be more than that, exponentially more than that. I have no idea. <laughs> but IPv6 is not heavily used. At least I hardly ever interact with it. NAT is the main, the main problem that, that we're going to run into. So how do we get around this? How do we get around the fact that there might be a firewall in the way or there might be network address translation, right? We, we might be on a private network with just one public IP address. Well, what we will do is our client one on the left here. I'll draw client one. Client one, in addition to making the SDP, so this is another part of the process, is going to go out to what is called a stun server. Okay, and the stun server is going to be, we're going to use Google stun server. We do not need to make it, and we don't need to know how it works, but we're going to go out and we're going to ask the stun server, can you please find a way for me to tell somebody else how to get here? And I have pulled up on the docs, stun stands for session traversal utilities for NAT, right? So that's what we're trying to mitigate. How can, can somebody please help us out here? It is a protocol to discover your public IP address and determine any restrictions in your router that would prevent a direct connection. The client will send a request to the stun server, so that's exactly what this arrow here is, and the stun server will reply with the client's public IP address and whether it's accessible. Okay, they've got a better diagram than I've got here, right? Peer A says to the stun server, who am I? And it sends back, you are, with this information. All right, what it's going to send back are called ICE candidates, okay? And I'm going to click on that one here. ICE stands for Interactive Connectivity Establishment. I think we already looked at that. 
we looked at this a, a little bit ago, but there are many reasons why we can't do a straight up connection. It needs to bypass firewalls that would prevent opening connections, give you a unique IP address. If like most situations, your device doesn't have a public IP address, that would be because of NAT, which we just talked about, and relay data through a server if your router doesn't allow you to. Okay, ICE uses stun and or turn servers to accomplish this. We will look at what an ICE candidate is, but the stun server, back on the whiteboard here, the stun server sends the ICE candidate back to the client, and then the client will send that ICE candidate up to the Socket.io server, who will then send it over to the other client. Wrapping both of them together, that means that the client on the right will have ICE candidates, ICE candidates meaning I know how to find the other, the other client, and it will have the SDP. Those two things together now mean we have gotten through the scary internet and we can connect in spite of NATs, firewalls, etc. And we know how to talk to each other. Client 2 on the right will send its ICE candidate and STP through Socket.io server back to Client 1 and the signaling service is complete. They have what they need. We could have used Carrier Pigeons. We could have used email or Twitter. That's really silly. So instead, we use our Socket.io server. We send it up. They both get it and now they can communicate. This is the most comprehensive page on signaling in the docs. Again, it's under the WebRTC API and then it's called signaling and video calling. But as you go down, it will break down the different pieces. Some of them you know, may not, may not make a ton of sense yet because we haven't done everything, but it is very long and they've got uh, better graphics than I do potentially uh, and so on. So in the next video, we will see all of this in action.